Hey everyone, thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's viewer requested presentation, we're going to be taking on the subject of SKS rarity from both a North American as well as a global perspective. This is a big topic, but I'm going to do my best to make it as simple and digestible as I reasonably can. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. As I'm sure you can imagine, I get a lot of emails from SKS owners, and more often than not, they want to know three things. What do I have? How much is it worth? And is it rare? Those first two questions are easy enough, but when it comes to the third, I often find myself struggling for just the right words. The thing is, rarity is relative, and measuring it relies on understanding a complex set of abstract and oftentimes inconsistent distinctions. Just to give a hyperbolic example of what I'm talking about, let's look at this 1954 Tula refurb. Even the most novice SKS collector should immediately recognize this is not a particularly rare example. But what if I said this is actually the rarest SKS carving on the planet, because as it so happens, this is the only 1954 Tula refurb in the world with this specific serial number. All jokes aside, our novice SKS collector would immediately recognize this logic as deeply flawed because most SKS pattern carvings have unique serial numbers. Generally speaking, that's the entire point of serial numbers. So that would be a ridiculous metric of rarity. And it is. But like I said, that was a hyperbolic example designed simply to point out the difference between actual rarity and perceived rarity. In a very real mathematical sense, Every SKS is one of one, but that's useless from a collector perspective. In order to arrive at anything useful, we need to look not just at what makes a rifle different from other rifles, but also what they have in common. In this way, we can put rifles in neat categories or variants and subvariants, and start to have a meaningful conversation about their comparative rarity. Let's flesh that out with a few less hyperbolic examples. As you can see, I've introduced a second rifle, specifically a 1954 Ishevsk Refurb. Same model, same year, same country, same condition, but different factory. The thing is, Tula made a lot of SKS 45s, Ishevsk only made a few SKS 45s, and just like that, we all agree that despite the overwhelming similarities between these two rifles, the fact that this rifle was made at Ishevsk makes it less common by comparison and therefore a more rare variant. Sounding pretty simple so far? I hope not, because that was a trick, and we're about to flip that little rule on his head. Here we got two more rifles, this time Type 56 carbines, a 1967 example made at State Arsenal 296, and a 1973 example made at State Arsenal 416. Same model, same country, same era of production, but different factories. State Arsenal 296 made a lot of Type 56 carbines, State Arsenal 416 only made a few Type 56 carbines, so using our logic from the previous example, we would conclude that because this rifle is objectively less common, it would be considered the more rare variant by comparison. Wrong. The thing is, factories other than State Arsenal 296 all just kind of get lumped together. We call them non-26s. They're great rifles, but they came from like 25 different factories and have hundreds of different factory marks. So even when we see one with markings we have never seen before, we don't generally consider it rare because when it comes to Type 56 carbines, rare factory markings are actually quite common. So here's where I'm going with this. Distinguishing what makes an SKS rare is technically complicated. And one of the reasons for this is the fact that perceived rarity doesn't simply refer to how common or uncommon a specific variant may be, but also includes an element of desirability. It's a lot like learning a language in the sense that there are a bunch of rules you need to know. And once you learn all the rules, you discover that not all rules apply all the time. A Soviet factory with low production numbers is rare. A Chinese factory with even lower production numbers is common. Go figure. And as one final example before we begin, I'd like to point out that the 1967 Type 56 carbine I've been holding this whole time, despite being exceedingly common according to most reasonable levels of distinction, is actually the rarest piece in my collection, and I'm not joking this time. This specific rifle happens to have been captured from the Palestinian Liberation Organization during the IDF's 1982 invasion of Lebanon, making it a truly rare specimen indeed. Once again, there are a lot of dimensions and moving parts that go into determining the actual and perceived rarity of SKS pattern carbines, and just when you think you've got it all figured out, there's usually something else to consider. So now that we've hopefully established just how complex and multifaceted the topic of SKS rarity can be, let's try and come up with a roadmap for navigating it all. For the purpose of this video, I will break down exactly five metrics by which you can measure the rarity of an SKS. As you've hopefully already deduced, not all metrics apply equally to all rifles, but if you have a working understanding of what they all are, you can hopefully start to see how they work together and can ultimately be used to get a sense of overall rarity. Of course, I'll provide practical examples as we go. So those five metrics of SKS rarity are going to be country of origin, factory of origin, production variations, condition, and provenance. Let's start with country of origin. This is an easy one because it's a category where perceived rarity and actual rarity overlap pretty seamlessly. In other words, it's pretty much just as simple as knowing how many rifles each country actually made and how many of them are still around. 
To that end, I like to visualize the rarity of SKS pattern carbines from different nations using an inverted triangle broken into three sections. Triangle likes triangles, big shocker. Up in this top section, we have what I call the collectibles. These are rifles which, at least at the time of filming, are realistically attainable for North American collectors of average means. In other words, if SKS collecting is a serious hobby in your life and you want to own an SKS pattern carbine produced by one of these countries, you could probably make that happen. Up at the top here, we have the Chinese. No surprises here, there's right around 10 million of these things. They also tend to be the cheapest and easiest to get, which is awesome for us collectors because in my opinion, they are among the highest quality and most historically interesting. How fortunate. Below the Chinese are gonna be the Soviets. Once again, not hard to find. Estimates number them somewhere between three and a half to four million. Generally, they command a significant premium over the Chinese, which is fine, I guess. Soviet weapons are super cool, although personally, I'll take a Type 56 carbine over an SKS-45 any day of the week. Below the Soviets are the Yugoslavians. Still quite common, probably about three quarter of a million units in circulation. More great rifles, often priced somewhere in between the Chinese and the Soviets. I've got a full video on Yugo SKS history that I'm fairly proud of. I think it's one of my better ones. Link in the description if you are interested. Starting to get into rare territory now, but still very much attainable, we have the Romanians. Probably only about 75,000 of these out there, but if you want one, you can still get one without taking out a loan. More great rifles, full video on the Romanians in the works, hopefully coming out very soon. And finally, at the bottom of the collectible section, we have the Albanians. Probably only about 18,000 of these things ever made, with more than half of them likely having been destroyed after the breakup of Yugoslavia. That said, these are still regularly available for sale in the United States for less than the price of a high-end AR, and they're not extremely hard to find in the Balkan region, I'm told. I should note that these are probably the closest anybody ever got to making a bad SKS, but still extremely cool and something any SKS collector should be proud to own. Moving down to the middle section, we have what I call the triumvirate of unicorns, those being the North Vietnamese, North Korean, and East German. Once upon a time, these were available to the common man, but unfortunately that ship has long sailed. And these days, if you want to own one of these, you'll need a tremendous amount of money or a tremendous amount of luck, two commodities that by nature tend to elude the masses. Unfortunately, I'm very much a representative of the masses in this case, as these rifles have been just outpacing my budget for the better part of a decade. It is what it is. In any case, any of these rifles would be considered exceptionally rare and centerpieces in any collection, particularly in the United States. And finally, we get into the shadow realm of the truly unobtainium, which are the SKS pattern carbines produced in countries that have not yet been documented or are otherwise impossible to acquire, at least in the US. Let me give you some examples. First, my research leads me to believe that under Chinese supervision, there were at least some SKS pattern carbines produced in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Zambia, and I doubt that is a complete list. I've never seen one, nor am I positive I would recognize one if it were right in front of me, but I believe they are out there all the same. If verified, they would represent an entirely new level of rarity. Another fun example I would put on this list, at least for Americans, are those SKS carbines made in the Russian Federation, as opposed to the Soviet Union. The legendary Mullet factory did newly manufacture SKS pattern carbines in the 21st century, and while I have a few European friends who casually own them, here in the United States, such rifles would again represent an entirely new tier of rarity. Also, given the current state of US-Russian relations, showing such rifles off in the United States these days would probably attract the same sort of federal task force that took down the great Larry Vickers. In any case, if you are judging rarity based on national origin, this is about what you're looking at. This is a pretty good representation of total global supply, and it holds pretty true on the U.S. market, although certainly in other regions with more or less comprehensive imports, your mileage may vary. Of course, we don't always measure the rarity of a specific rifle based on national origin alone, especially when we're dealing with examples from countries near the top of the triangle. In other words, maybe we could say Romanian SKSs and below carry a degree of rarity simply by virtue of their national origin. However, if a Chinese, Soviet, or Yugoslavian SKS is to be considered rare, that's going to be for reasons other than national origin. So let's move on to the second metric. All right, so now let's talk factory of origin, and luckily this is a much simpler conversation. When it comes to Chinese SKS pattern carbines, there are really two factories to be aware of. State Arsenal 296 and everybody else. That doesn't mean we can't absolutely nerd out deciphering the origins of the dozens of other Chinese factories. That's honestly how I spend most of my weekends. But the cold truth is that from a perceived rarity perspective, nobody really cares. There are totally Chinese SKS pattern carbines we consider rare, but generally they aren't rare because of what factory they came from. There are so many odd Chinese rifles from so many rare factories that they just at a certain point stop being rare. So once again, if a Chinese SKS pattern carbine is to be considered rare, that's definitely not going to be because it's Chinese, and it's probably not going to be because of what factory it came from either. In terms of the Soviets, we actually pretty much covered this in our earlier example. 
There are two Soviet factories which produced SKS 45s, Tula and Ashevsk. All else being equal, the Ashevsk rifles are considered rare in comparison to the Tula rifles because there are roughly one order of magnitude fewer of them. Super simple. Even more simple is every other type of SKS we might encounter. Yugoslavia, Romania, Albania, East Germany, North Vietnam, North Korea only produced rifles at one factory each, as far as I'm aware. In summary, factory of origin really only makes a practical difference in terms of determining rarity when it's distinguishing between Soviet rifles. For everybody else, if the rifle is perceived as rare, that's probably going to be for reasons other than what factory it came from. Easy peasy, let's move on to the third metric. Next, we're talking about production variations, and fair warning, this is the biggest topic. Production variations include, but are not necessarily limited to, variations in construction, mechanical properties, model designations, marking formats, and date of manufacture. There is a lot that goes into this, and there's absolutely no way I can map that whole territory for you today, but I can certainly point you in the right direction with some practical examples. When talking about Chinese specimens, we see everything under the sun in terms of production variations, and it all matters. The landscape of Chinese SKS collecting is an absolute jungle, and that's precisely why it's my number one passion in small arms. Half of my channel is devoted to this subject. I've got hours and hours of content charging through that jungle with machete. For today's purposes, I'll try to just sketch you an outline. First, there are Type 56 carbines that use less common construction materials. If you've got a stamped or cast receiver, that's exceptionally rare. If you've got a camphor wood or Chinese factory laminate stock, those are pretty darn rare as well. Factory FRP handguard? Not super rare, but still definitely under the rarity umbrella. And we can go all day. Large bit versus small bit end milling. Lightning cut versus blank bolt carriers. Milled versus stamped fire control groups. Long lug versus short lug versus pressed and pinned barrels. Inspection marks and assembly numbers. None of those features on their own make a rifle rare, but they are all things which we need to be able to understand and contextualize in order to positively ID distinct variants. Often when we establish rarity in Chinese rifles, it is by recognizing specific combinations of otherwise common features. In terms of mechanical properties, we start looking at stuff like bayonet types, reverse takedown levers, fire and pin geometry, and that's not even scratching the surface of that whole separate class of rifles, which I call commercial non-conventional carbines. That category would include rifles like the SKSS, SKSM, SKSD, the so-called paratroopers, and so many more, all of which are objectively rare by comparison to the more conventional SKS layouts, like the commercial conventional carbine and the Type 56 carbine itself. Speaking of Type 56 carbines, let's talk model designations. These two rifles are seemingly identical, and indeed they were made in the same year, at the same factory, by the same people, to the same specs. And yet, this rifle is considerably more rare than this rifle, for the simple reason that it has the export model designation of M21 versus the domestic model designation of Type 56. Let's talk about marking formats. This rifle is just another Type 56 carbine, and yet is more rare than most because it does not include any model designation at all, and it uses a non-standard serialization format. This rifle is rare still because not only does it not include any model designation, it doesn't even include a factory mark. And with those examples fresh in your mind, you might say, Triangle, my Chinese SKS doesn't have a model designation or factory mark either. Does that make it rare? And my answer is a big fat, it depends. Because in addition to the markings I just described, I was simultaneously referencing all the other variations in construction type and mechanical properties we've covered so far. Again, in order to tie a Chinese rifle to a specifically rare or desirable production block, aka a collectible subvariant, it requires us to recognize recognize complete combinations of features, not just one or two. It is very common to misidentify Chinese rifles by recognizing isolated features outside of their larger context. Finally, in terms of dates of production, most Chinese SKS pattern carbines have their dates of manufacture coded into their serial numbers. Obviously, I have a whole separate video on that topic. For now, let's just say that production began in 1956 and continued for at least 40 years. Determining data manufacture is always an interesting endeavor. However, as far as rarity is concerned, it's once again just one of many elements we consider when identifying specific production runs, which may or may not be noteworthy and desirable enough to perceive as comparatively rare. So one last time, the Chinese SKS world is a jungle. There's 10 million of these things produced over nearly half a century, and consequently they exhibit more production variation than the rest of the SKS producing world combined. I can't break that all down in this video, but if you're interested in taking that deep dive, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and check out my SKS playlist because that's a big part of what I do on this channel. In the meantime, let's move on to talking about some production variations in non-Chinese rifles. As for the Soviets, it's a lot more simple, but still complicated enough that I'm going to be glossing over all kinds of things. Non-chrome line bores on an SKS-45 indicate production in or before 1951, and those are more rare than the chrome line bores that followed. 
There are other observable variations in construction and mechanical functions, such as spring-loaded firing pins, lever geometry, differently abled gas blocks, safety styles, and many, many other elements, which are associated with early or later eras of production and corresponding levels of actual or perceived rarity. In terms of markings, we see a few minor evolutions over time, but for whatever reason, some people seem to go absolutely nuts for the Soviet rifles with less than a four-digit numerical serial number. I assume this stems from confusion about how Soviet block serialization actually works. As it were, roughly 10% of Soviet rifles have less than a four-digit serial number, which if you're doing the math at home, corresponds suspiciously well to the fact that roughly 10% of all numbers under 10,000 also have less than four digits. That is assuming you don't put a zero in front of them, which, spoiler alert, the Russians did not do. In any case, seeing less than four numerical digits on a Soviet rifle doesn't tell us much on its own, aside from the fact that that rifle was at the beginning of an arbitrarily defined production block. To me, prioritizing these rifles feels a little reminiscent of the my rifle is rare because its serial number is unique argument, but I guess there's some room for contrasting opinions on that one. And just to be clear, this is not the same as the four, five, and six digit serial number distinctions on the so-called Chinese ghost rifles. That would be an example in which number of digits actually corresponds to something meaningful, in that case, proximity to the original start of production. Back to the Soviets, though. As for dates of manufacture, Tula rifles made in 1949 are very rare, and rifles made in 1948 are mythically rare. Rifles made from 1950 to 1955 are generally considered pretty run-of-the-mill, although, as I previously mentioned, there are some interesting production variations inside of that block. And rifles made from 1956 to 1958 are a little less common and carry a splash of perceived and actual rarity. In terms of Ashevsk rifles, there were only two years of production, with 1954 being the more common year of production and 1953 being the less common year of production, making 1953 the rarer and more desirable year. And that's a great example of how these different rarity metrics can start to combine. Is a Soviet SKS-45 inherently rare? No. Is a Soviet SKS-45 made at a Shevsk factory inherently rare? Yes. Is a 1953 Ashevsk rifle even rarer still? Also, yes. Let's go to Yugos now. There are three main types of Yugo rifle. The M5966A1 is the most common variant, although even within this variant, there are distinctions. For example, M5966A1s with tritium night sights are more rare than M5966A1s with phosphor paint night sights. On a related note, M5966A1s made in the 1980s, serial prefixes R through Z, and then A, B, and C again, are more rare than M5966A1s made in the 1970s, serial prefixes G through P. Original M5966s, non-A1s that is, lack night sights altogether and are more rare than M5966A1s. Please note, just to make it extra confusing, some if not many M5966s have been updated to A1 specs with night sights added, but you can still identify them with the serial number prefixes D and E. Rarer still are the original pre-1967 M59s, which lack not only night sights, but also all of the provisions for launching rifle grenades. These rifles are the rarest main production variant and represent less than 5% of total Yugo production. In addition to the fact that they basically just look like regular late pattern Soviet SKS 45s, these can be identified with the serial prefixes B and C. Although remember that prefixes B and C were also used by the very last years of M5966 A1 production. So of course you need to verify mechanical variations in addition to the markings in order to get a good ID. And then on top of your main production variants, you've also got post-war civilian conversion Yugos, and it's a whole separate can of worms, but let's just say those are fundamentally pretty rare as well. That is everywhere except the Balkans. Next, you have the pre-production models built under Soviet supervision, and although I've never personally seen documentation of any of these, the fact that the earliest known M59s have a B prefix leads me to believe that the very first match might just have had an A prefix. Just a hunch. Oh, and then of course you got a few long-barreled M59s floating around. At least we can say those definitely exist, but they are still quite rare. Romanians and Albanians. Thank goodness we're getting a little simpler here. Are some years more rare than others? Yes. Are there some other minor variations to track? I guess there are, yeah. The thing is, I don't really care that much, to be honest. One man only has so much bandwidth for these things, and as far as I'm concerned, a Romanian is a Romanian, and an Albanian is an Albanian. I love the rifles. I love the history and cultural context. Like I alluded to earlier, I'm actually doing tons of research on the Romanian right now for an upcoming presentation. But if you want to go down the rabbit hole of which years or which technical differences are worth caring about, I'm probably not your guy, at least for today's video. Everything else, not a chance. If you have one of the triumvirate or even the unobtainiums, I'm jealous enough that I'm not even going to bother helping you determine exactly how rare it is. Congratulations. It's rare enough. All right, so that metric was a big one, but we've got the worst behind us now, so let's move on to condition, which is gonna be a lot faster. As far as I'm concerned, there are really three elements to condition, and the first is pretty self-explanatory. 
All else being equal, rifles in better condition are always gonna be perceived as more rare than rifles in worse condition, even if that isn't technically true in the moment. The thing is, collectors understand that changes in condition pretty much only go in one direction, and that's down. Therefore, given enough time, the average condition of a defined set of out of production firearms will inevitably deteriorate. If you have an example in good condition and you keep it in good condition, it will grow a little bit more rare every day simply because not everyone who has a rifle like yours is preserving it in the same way. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. I'm obviously a big proponent of getting out there and shooting your rifles, but that doesn't change the basic equation here. All good things in life come at a price. I should mention that this element of condition also includes things like mismatched parts, sporterization, and refinishing. It's very common for SKS patterns to be mixed up, refinished, or permanently modified, and once again, that is most often a one-way street. Your bubbled up or desporterized SKS might be uncommon and unique, but that doesn't mean collectors will consider it rare. In fact, the opposite is true. The more time that passes, the more rare, original, fully matching weapons become, and that's what people really care about. And just to be clear, I'm not throwing shade at bubbled or desporterized SKSs, particularly not at desporterized SKSs. I think that's a very noble pursuit. I'm just relaying the facts of how that plays into rarity. The second element of condition is factory refurbishment. Here I'm referring to processes by which a rifle is no longer in its truly original condition, as in the way that it left the factory floor. However, it maintains a condition which is still historically correct, generally by way of refinishing, force matching, or repairs conducted in a foreign military depot. Generally speaking, these would be considered less rare than truly original rifles, but more rare than rifles subjected to similar treatments outside of a historic military environment. Let's look at some examples. The obvious place this comes up with SKS patterns is with factory refurbished Soviet SKS 45s. Oftentimes we classify the condition of otherwise original SKS 45s as non-refurb, light refurb, or heavy refurb. And those are in order of desirability from most to least. Non-refurbs will be as issued, which means they are not force matched. They do not have any of the black high temperature paint. They do not have any slashed square refurbishment marks. And in most cases, they will have a hardwood stock. Very late production SKS 45s may have been originally issued with the laminate stock, but that is the exception, not the rule. By contrast, a heavy refurb like this one will typically be covered in that black paint, which is most obviously visible on the bolt carrier because changing that bright steel element to a matte black really changes the overall appearance of the rifle. Additionally, a heavy refurb may have a laminate stock, force matching may be present, and we will see plenty of those slash square refurb stamps. Light refurb is a pretty ambiguous term, but generally we would expect a light refurb to have some evidence of refurbishing, but certainly not all or even most of the features I just mentioned. Just to put all that in context, let's go back to my Shevsk example. Is a Soviet SKS-45 inherently rare? Still no. Is an Ashevsk SKS inherently rare? Still yes. Is a 1953 Ashevsk even more rare? Still yes. Is a non-refurb 1953 Ashevsk even more rare still? Yes. Hopefully that's a good and simple example of how these different metrics can stack together. Now, the Soviets are definitely the biggest culprits in terms of factory refurbishment, but we can see similar trends on a smaller scale with different countries of origin, especially China. Remember those commercial conventional carbines I mentioned earlier? Many, if not most, commercial SKS pattern carbines sold by China were force-matched or refurbished military rifles, sometimes sanitized of their original military markings and sometimes not. Long story short, depending on how extensive that refurbishment process was and to what degree they were sanitized, some of them can still be associated with rare and desirable military production blocks and some of them cannot. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. As for other countries, the rule is basically this. All else being equal, factory refurbishment reduces the perceived rarity of a rifle as compared to non-refurbs, but doesn't have remotely as negative of an effect as changes in condition caused by civilian end users. And just to add one last layer of complexity, sometimes factory refurbishment actually significantly adds to the rarity, even compared to non-refurbs. And that would be the case with rifles that have been specifically refurbished for the purpose of drill and ceremony or honor guard purposes, which generally speaking can be found in any country. The SKS makes for a great DNC rifle. And when you find those in the collector market, those are pretty cool. As for the third element of condition, let's zero in on why I preface that last sentence with all else being equal. Sometimes all else is not equal. In limited and specific circumstances, SKS pattern carbines from any country can exhibit specifically desirable wear patterns or signs of use which correlate it with a specific moment in history. When this is the case, modification or even deterioration to the original condition can actually lead to a spike in perceived and actual rarity. Here's an example. We've seen this rifle before. This is my 1967 Israeli capture. 
If all else was truly equal, this rifle would be less rare than a 1967 Type 56 carbine in better condition. After all, there were more than 200,000 rifles produced during this relatively uninteresting production run, and the condition of my example is far from perfect. It's mostly original, and that's a good start, but it's fairly beat up, it's got a mismatched magazine, and to top it all off, somebody who definitely didn't work on the factory floor at State Arsenal 296 took it upon themselves to paint some numbers on it in a language which is definitely not Chinese. If all else was truly equal, that would be a pretty bad start for measuring the rarity of this rifle based on condition. Well, in this case, that's obviously not the full story. Every one of those apparent detractions, when observed within the greater context of additional variations in markings and construction elements, place this specific rifle at a particularly poignant moment in history, and that increases its rarity significantly. As another example, quite a few guys who got in on the recent Sinobanian imports got rifles with trench art and mismatched but distinctly Albanian-made components stuck on Chinese rifles. This is another great example of when the imperfect condition of an SKS can actually tell us a more compelling story than would be possible with a rifle that looks fresh off the factory floor. Condition is complicated. And that segues us nicely into our final metric of rarity, which is provenance. Like I just illustrated, some rifles can be tied to specific moments in history, and that can increase their rarity dramatically. Sometimes we can infer that from condition alone, but in other cases, a rifle might just come with a verifiable story. Example, a childhood friend and neighbor of mine owned one of the rarest SKS pattern carbines I have ever seen, which was an inoperable 1960s Type 56 carbine. The reason it was inoperable was because it had taken a 20 millimeter autocannon round straight through the receiver, which I guess goes back to condition a bit, but what I really want to emphasize now is that it came with an extremely specific and verifiable story. Thing is, that particular carbine was picked up in a particular field in Vietnam that my neighbor's father had put a lot of 20 millimeter holes in earlier that day, albeit with the help of the American taxpayer and a Douglas A1 Skyraider. Anecdote aside, documented war trophies to include Vietnam bringbacks are pretty much always going to be more rare and desirable than anything remotely equivalent that lacks that type of provenance. And as I often stress on this channel, Vietnam is not the only important event that an SKS can be connected to. We talked about Lebanon already today. We've talked about Kosovo in a previous video. One good friend of this channel owns a Zimbabwean issued Type 56 carbine that may well have been used to shoot at him during the Rhodesian Bush War. Another friend of this channel has told me stories about using his M5966A1 in Bosnia during the 1990s. And heck, the stories aren't over yet. Here's a screenshot of a Russian SKS-45 being captured by the IDF in Gaza in November of 2023. And who knows, maybe that rifle and more like it will end up in somebody's collection one day. One can only hope. The point is, if your SKS was tied to something meaningful and you can prove it, you've got a rare SKS. All right, guys, so those are the five metrics by which we can measure the actual and perceived rarity of an SKS, and hopefully now you have a pretty strong foundation from which you can determine what does make an SKS rare. And like I said, applying all this takes practice. Sometimes all it takes is one metric, but usually it requires considering all of them in relationship to one another and recognizing the complex and inconsistent rules by which they interact. So last thing before we close out, let's ask the question we probably should have asked from the beginning, which is why does all this matter in the first place? As usual, it depends. I'll give you my answer. I don't really care what makes an SKS rare. I care what makes an SKS interesting, and often those conversations intersect. Talking about SKS rarity is a really good excuse to understand the SKS better and better. And at the end of the day, I truly believe that knowledge and appreciation for these rifles is more valuable than the rifles themselves. Don't get me wrong, actually owning these rifles is amazing and I highly recommend it, but ultimately what makes owning these rifles amazing is the insight that they provide. They are like books. They exist in the physical world and they look great on a mantelpiece, but at the end of the day, their true value is their ability to help us better understand the world we live in and our place in that world. On a more practical note, I guess it's proved to note that sometimes stuff needs to be shot, and these are pretty great for that as well, but that's not what I want to communicate right now. There's plenty of time for that in other videos. What I really want to leave you with is this. Rarity is relative. We established that from the very beginning. Sure, some SKS pattern carbines are more rare than others, sometimes a lot more rare than others, but at the end of the day, there are only 15 or so million of these things spread out over 8 billion people. If you're lucky enough to own even one, that's already a pretty rare thing and something to celebrate. And if you're one of those people who sees my collection and experiences something resembling envy, I promise you that I experience no less envy when I see collections that are more comprehensive than mine or I see examples that I've always wanted. Possessing these rifles is useful and enjoyable, but on its own, collecting will never satisfy the soul. There will always be one more. That hunger will never go away. Listening to them, learning from them, and to be honest, loving the ones you have, that might actually get you somewhere.
Unsolicited advice, I know, but I've never pretended to not be a romantic when it comes to collecting surplus rifles. And that's the video, guys. As always, if you found it to be educational, entertaining, or otherwise worth the time you spent watching it, I would greatly appreciate it if you could take the time to let me know by doing the YouTube stuff, like, comment, and subscribe. That's what grows the channel. It really does make a difference. It motivates me to make more and better videos as well. If you are new to the channel and want more in-depth SKS content, I encourage you to check out my SKS playlist. Lots of great information in there, some of which you will not find anywhere else. And with that, thanks again for taking the time to check out this video, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.